Hello everyone and welcome to the Importer Self-Assessment Program webinar. Uh, sorry to keep you waiting for just a few minutes. Um, uh, without further ado, uh, let's get started. Um, uh, the plan is uh, to have the webinar for uh, a total of 90 minutes, but um, uh, the content portion is going to be for the first hour and then we'd love to open it up for as many questions as you have. So, um, uh, and I just want to also highlight that if you have any questions, uh, feel free to use the chat window down below. And um, uh, I'm delighted to take questions at any time, uh, but um, at the end would be uh, ideal. So with that, uh, let's get started. So uh, the purpose of our webinar today is to discuss the ISA program and the ISA application. So this is the agenda that we're going to follow today. First, I'd like to talk about the background of the ISA program and how it got started. Then we'll talk about the benefits of the ISA program. And a lot of people are really divided here. Some people like to join the ISA, the others won't touch it with the barge pole. And I'll discuss the pros and cons. What are the prerequisites for joining the ISA? I'll also talk about two very important pieces of information that Customs has shared with us, which is uh, the components of effective internal controls and the best practices for compliant companies. Then we'll jump into the meat and potatoes of the presentation, which is really the application process. How do you go step by step to uh, becoming an IC member? And common pitfalls to avoid, and also the future of this program because it is in a transition or it's overdue for a rehaul. So with that said, let's uh, jump right in. Now, uh, ISA started around the same time as the focused assessment, uh, which is in the year 2002 was when the first Federal Register announced the Importer Self-Assessment Program. Now that marked a shift in how Customs viewed its activities. Uh, for um, over 200 years, U.S. Customs was part of the Treasury Department, where its main focus was collecting customs duties and revenue. However, after the tragic uh, incident of 9-11, 16 years ago, customs became part of the Department of Homeland Security, and all of a sudden, cargo security became, and protecting our borders, rightfully became the main focus. At that time, U.S. Customs, which is now called U.S. Bureau of Customs and Border Protection, had dual responsibilities of not only managing the country's borders and keeping us secure, but also ensuring customs compliance by importers and collecting revenue. So what they really did is introduce two programs called the CTPAT program as well as ISA. The CTPAD program was to allow companies with good security procedures into almost this green channel where they have reduced inspections. And Customs also created this ISA club, if you will, the Importer Self-Assessment uh, Club, so that companies that have good compliance procedures can kind of go through this um, you know, low customs audit pool. And um, they provided a lot of meaningful benefits to both CTPAT members as well as ISA members. And I'll talk about that in more detail. Since then, um, customs, the ISA program has really been in my, uh, a success in my view. It could have been a huge success, but uh, it's been a success for the following reasons. It got some initial large wins with many large companies already joining ISA. Currently, ISA importers are um, 
bring in more than 25% of all the goods being imported into the United States. And that's commensurate with the amount of value of the goods as well uh, that's being brought into the United States. I say companies are traditionally companies that have good trade compliance teams or procedures and already represent a very small revenue risk for customs. So by getting these large or well-run uh, customs compliant companies to join ISA, customs is really focusing its limited resources on unknown companies or companies that have uh, you know, some suspicious or poor practices. And what does ISA do? It uh, you know, supports customs mission. And for the importer, I wish I could have a slide which shows somebody resting on a hammock on a beach, but it's not that great. It, but what it does give you is peace of mind. And that's what my customers, uh, many of them attest to. They say that you don't have to worry about an audit. You've just got to do the ongoing self-testing, self-audit, good compliance, and at the end of the year, provide the ISA annual notification letter. So my customers love ISA. Now the prerequisites for joining the ISA, and I'm gonna be talking about this uh, in more detail later, is really CTPAT. That's the first uh, door you need to pass in order to join ISA. And a lot of people say, you know, that doesn't make sense. CTPAT is about security, and ISA is about compliance. But the truth is, uh, what a Customs wants to do is its vision is uh, create a common CTPAT and ISA kind of portal group. It's this is uh, uh, the known as the Trusted Trader Program. And I'll talk about this at the end in terms of customs future plans for ISA. But uh, many other countries around the world, after they created, U the US government created CTPAT, many countries around the world created their own version of CTPAT, um, which included customs compliance elements as well. Uh, I'm talking about the European Union's AEO program, which is the Authorized Economic Operators, and Australia, Japan, and several other countries, Singapore, have tied in security and compliance together in their preferential programs uh, for compliant uh, companies. The other prerequisites is you've got to be a U.S. company and importing for the last two years. Now, what I really want to focus on is a very contentious issue. There are over 600 companies that are CTPAT members, sorry, uh, that are importer self-assessment uh, members, ISA members. There's well over 15,000 who are CTPAT members, but about 600 that are ISA. And it's surprising because uh, customs audit pool, you know, is about you know, 5,000 companies. So why are so few companies joining ISA? You know, one reason, in my view, is that customs wants companies who are compliant in their customs procedures and who can demonstrate the accuracy of their customs transactions to join ISA. So it obviously means that the other companies, you know, they're not quite there and they suspect that they're not fully compliant. Number two, uh, there could be an inherent suspicion of uh, customs uh, coming in and reviewing the company's uh, procedures. Um, many people say it's like the fox guarding the hen house. Now, I believe in better cooperation with the regulatory agencies, but I, I can uh, respect why some companies have that fear. Uh, so those are the main reasons. Um, number one, uh, the fear of customs, and number two, companies are just not ready to join the ISA program. Another uh, 
you know, a fear that some uh, companies have expressed, which I think is totally um, misplaced, is job security. They say, Deep, if we are taken out of the audit pool by joining this ISA program, uh, don't we become redundant? And I say, no, you don't. On the contrary, uh, you know, you're keeping your company out of trouble. And ISA still requires that you have continuous monitoring. So I don't see any reason for downsizing a compliance department. So that's my um, take on the benefits of ISA. I think it more than compensates for any negatives of joining the program. Uh, and obviously the benefits as written on this uh, slide is that you're taken away from the focused assessment pool. You may still have, uh, you know, single issue audits um, every now and then, but um, trust me, getting out of the audit pool is, is a very big deal and far less intrusion from customs. The other benefits of ISA are enhanced prior disclosure. What this means is companies normally are allowed to make a prior disclosure and confess, uh, in a sense, to any errors they may have found before an investigation starts or before the company is aware that Customs has initiated an investigation. If you're an ISA member, Customs actually gives you 30 days to submit the prior disclosure after even they find out about that error. So it's really a spirit of uh, cooperation there. Uh, and uh, God forbid, uh, should there ever be some errors for which you get a penalty, being an ISA member and cooperating with Customs <clears throat> is a mitigating factor. In addition, uh, you have a hotline to the Office of Strategic Trade and the Regulatory Audit Division uh, where, uh, you know, uh, they, you go to the start of the line if you're an ISA member, you know, they take you seriously and they treat you like a customer. So, so that's good. If this is all a such great news, where do I sign up, right? So how do companies join the ISA program and how fast can they join? What I tell companies is never rush into the ISA program. You first need to have your ducks in a row and then submit the application. The first thing you need to do uh, is become a CTPAD member if for some reason you're not already. Uh, many companies um, are sometimes they're debating the benefits of CTPAD they believe that uh, they don't get enough customs inspections or delays anyway. So what's the benefit of joining CTPAD? Well, one big benefit of joining CTPAD is that it opens the door to future and other customs benefits, such as this ISA program. So that's the one first step you need to take. Secondly, you need to ensure that you have a system of business records that demonstrates the accuracy of customs transactions. Now this line is straight from the customs website and the rules for ISA. And what does it mean? <clears throat> Maintain a system of business records that demonstrates the accuracy of customs transactions. What this means is that at every stage where there could be an inaccuracy, you really have records in place to prevent any such risk of inaccuracy, such as when you import your customs broker files the entry, you should check that the entry is correct, the classification codes are correct, the value is correct, any preferential trade program has been correctly, uh, uh, you know, opted for. Secondly, when your goods arrive at your door, at your warehouse, you should have a good system of checking that the quantity received is actually commensurate with the quantity on your invoice and customs entry. So you're not underpaying or overpaying 
or customs for the quantity of goods. Finally, when you're making a payment for that uh, product, you need to ensure that your finance team is not overpaying for those items because then obviously you're misrepresenting the value of those goods when you made the entry. So the system of business records really means that all of this should tie up your import entry, your receiving records, as well as your payment records so that customs can be satisfied that your entire transaction is accurate. The other prerequisite that customs wants to see is they want to see internal controls established, documented, and continued uh, to be implemented. What exactly are internal controls? And I'm going to be talking about internal controls later in this presentation, but just remember why internal controls are important. Customs believes that companies that have good internal controls are far greater to have accuracy in their customs transactions than companies without internal controls. In fact, Customs once did a study about 15 years ago and they saw that out of 400 companies, the companies that had poor internal controls, the average penalty from those companies was nine times greater than companies that had good internal controls. So they're using internal controls as a predictor of future customs compliance. And um, as I said, I'll talk more about internal controls in a little bit and tell you what exactly customs says it is. And finally, once you submit your ISA application and a memorandum of understanding, the balls in customs court to review it and then they'll schedule an application review meeting and so on. Now, what exactly are the components of good internal controls? Now, for many years, customs has been using what's known as the COSO standards, which I'm sure all of you are very familiar with. But uh, remember that the COSO standards were recently amended about four years ago, yeah, 2013. And that prompted customs to really review its uh, focused assessment program as well and keep it uh, you know, in line with the new internal controls. So the internal controls that customs recommends companies have are really these five categories. And we'll go through each. Uh, it's not very intuitive, but uh, it's very important that when you do your application for the ISA, that you mirror these internal controls and show customs you're meeting them so that they, uh, you're speaking the same language. We'll cover the control environment, the first component. Second, risk assessment. Third, internal control activities, information communication, and finally, monitoring. Now, the control environment, if I were to describe this in a sentence, it would be the culture or the management commitment. So what Customs wants to see demonstrated is that you all have a culture of compliance, uh, not where upper management is saying, just get it done. Oh, comply with whatever you need to, but get the shipments out of the door because it's month end, right? Uh, they want to see upper management say uh, and create the tenor saying that our company believes in compliance and we do not tolerate any non-compliant activity. That's a control environment that Customs wants to see. The second thing is they really want to see that you've done some risk assessment of what could go wrong in your import process. Every company is different. Uh, some companies uh, don't just have a sales price valuation. They have different types of valuations. So getting the valuation correct could be a risk. Some companies have many different types of HTS codes and products. So getting the HTS numbers is a risk. Some companies do a lot of repair and returns. 
So getting the whole chapter 98 process down is a risk. So have you reviewed the risks of your company? So that's what cust Customs uh, really wants to see, uh, that you know, you've done an assessment. Other internal control activities, uh, this really starts with written procedures in a nutshell. They really want to see that you've got a customs compliance manual, a policy and procedures, desktop work instructions, because customs believes that these internal control activities are like your GPS, which means that if you don't have a written procedure, it's highly likely that your company's compliance program will get lost along the way. Uh, you know, I like to believe uh, that, uh, you know, what if uh, you win the lottery? Uh, do you have written procedures for your, uh, uh, your successor so that they can do the job while you're on holiday? Information and communication. I think this is very important. Many companies, uh, I see they, all the knowledge about trade compliance is restricted to one or two or this department called trade compliance but very few related departments know what they do. The related departments to trade compliance are purchasing because they buy the product from other vendors, is R&D because many times they import prototypes and they export products, uh, customer service because they're in charge of the repair, merchandise, RMA process, and also they are responsible for probably giving out NAFTA certificates to your customers in Canada, Mexico, unbeknownst to you. The legal team, the tax team, in charge of valuation and customs duties, as well as shipping, receiving, and warehouse and global logistics needs to know how international trade regulations impact them as well. So if there are so many departments that have a role to play in international trade, don't you think they too need to know about trade compliance? Obviously, yes. And what Customs wants is how you're educating and communicating with all these different departments as well. Uh, just to go back uh, for a second. Uh, oops. Okay, sorry. Sorry, I've just, uh, excuse me, I just um, moved the wrong slide. On information communication, I want to share a best practice that works for a lot of my ISA companies. One is, that is uh, to create an international trade council with representatives from every relevant department and try to meet once every three months and discuss issues that have come up regarding imports or even exports. Now creating this International Trade Council ensures really that you have the buy-in from all these different departments and everyone takes on the shared responsibility of global trade compliance. I think it's a great idea and Customs loves it a lot. Finally, monitoring after you set up this great depart, uh, customs compliance atmosphere and culture with the management commitment, with the risk assessment, written procedures, good training and information sharing. How do you know it's really working if you're not measuring and auditing it on a periodic basis? You know, I tell people that the most difficult question in a job interview is, tell me about your weaknesses. So therefore, I always tell companies that don't let the trade compliance team <laughs> audit themselves. Uh, you don't have to bring in a consultant from outside. You could even have maybe your finance team or your audit team or your quality team, give them a list of questions, let them select a sample size and do a periodic audit on you. That's something customers would really appreciate seeing. So apart from this document of, um, you know, the effective internal controls for companies, Customs has also provided ISA prospective companies 
with a document called Best Practices for Compliant Companies. Now, I tell my customers who are planning on joining ISA, don't just read these best practices as a reference material or, oh, good, Customs has given some examples. No, try to read this as benchmarks that you need to meet and exceed so you can tell Customs, check this out. We have met each of these 10 different elements that you have put out on your website as best practices for ISA compliant companies. So let's look through each of these 10 items right now. Number one, have management commitment. As I spoke earlier, uh, uh, the way to do this really is to have a letter from your CEO saying how important trade compliance is to your company and how um, uh, there should be an anonymous method of reporting any errors. Uh, you know, if people want to, you know, disclose any errors or report them. And also say that your company doesn't tolerate any, you know, violations of customs policy. That's one. Number two, how do you know how good your customs compliance program is or what progress you're made, making unless you have some metrics? And you will not believe that over 90% of all companies I deal with don't know how much customs duties they're paying in, the, you know, in previous years. They may know their entire transportation spend because that's one general 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 ledger entry but to go deep down and find out how much customs duties you're paying is something very few companies do now what i recommend is find out how much customs duties you're paying so you can take all steps and create goals to legally find ways and strategies to minimize it develop formal procedures as we mentioned under internal controls Having written procedures is critical for, to join the ISA program, and that's almost one of the first things that Customs asks for when you fill out your ISA application questionnaire. They want to know, <clears throat> they want to see your internal control manual. In addition to that, they want to see uh, various things in your uh, written procedures. They want to see a self-testing plan, they want to see your audit approach. They want to know, you know, who are the responsible people and uh, in your uh, division. And they really want to see the leadership flow chart, right? Establishing training programs. Uh, nowadays, there are many training options. Um, uh, I don't mean to put a plug for DST Global Academy, but uh, I want to pat you on the back for taking this training today, uh, which obviously meets customs uh, uh, guidance of uh, ongoing training. Uh, but more importantly, find a way to communicate what you've learned today or you learn at trade conferences and share it with other departments or people in your team. That's very important. Some companies uh, have a best practice of having an intranet where on their home internal homepage, they talk about customs compliance matters. They have their procedure, presentations, and relevant guidelines. Uh, say, for example, about hand carry or the valuation policy. Everything's on their intranet. And it's not just one huge 200-page customs manual, but every chapter could be a separate PDF so companies uh, and other departments know where to go to find that reference material. As we mentioned under the internal control systems, doing reviews is very important so you know how well you're doing and even getting somebody in from the outside is what customs considers reasonable care by getting an external expert. But like I said, even if you do it internally, by uh, you know, soliciting the help of another department, 
that's just as good and customs likes to see those documented audit results. This is what I talked about on creating a compliance group. This isn't just a customs group. The first sentence over here is customs language. But what I recommend is going over and above and create a trade compliance council with members from legal, tax, finance, uh, you know, customer service, purchasing, shipping, receiving, and obviously logistics. So you'll meet at least every three months and keep an agenda, keep written minutes, so you'll discuss problem issues that may have occurred regarding international shipments and figure out ways of resolving it. Usually in large companies, it's never one department's problem. It's not the problem of the purchasing department because everything is interlinked. It could be the purchasing department didn't notify finance about uh, assist and then it impacts you as trade compliance. You know, so there's many linkages. So creating an international trade council is a great idea. Access executives for resources. This really boils down to having the buy-in from above. And there's really no wand, um, you know, no magic wand. Usually what I try to do is to tell uh, upper management about, you know, the potential poor image or negative publicity. That really motivates them more than customs duties and penalties and delays the bad publicity so you know they can also uh, you know give you the resources you need either time money resources or technology uh, strategies that have helped is um, uh, you know telling them what your competitors or other companies in your field are doing and obviously uh, the upper management always loves to hear stories where compliance saves money which it does in the case of ISA because uh, you know you probably won't pay those hefty fines uh, and lawyer fees uh, that you might have if you get a huge penalty after a focus assessment so an ISA really is a is a great thing for companies to join and uh, good luck trying to make that case to your upper management I'm happy to give you uh, any advice if you want to reach out to me after this webinar you know I believe compliance requirements for suppliers can really take away 90% of your headaches if you're the import compliance manager. Uh, I see most of the headaches come because your foreign supplier in Brazil or India or uh, you know Honduras has used a, a wrong HTS number, has used inconsistent paperwork, has not filled the paperwork legibly. So you know has not included the correct supporting documentation. So if you create compliance requirements for your suppliers, which is like a import guide for your vendors, can you imagine how easy and simple life would be? So that's what customs recognizes and likes to see as well. Uh, they also like to see standard purchase order language in your contracts. Record keeping. You know, I'm shocked at um, uh, how many companies still don't have proper record keeping. Uh, I've noticed um, uh, companies receive their invoices from the freight folder. They'll keep the first page, which is the bill, and stamp it saying, you know, uh, reviewed and send it to accounts payable. But, uh, you know, they actually just throw away the rest. And I say, what's that? They say, oh, that's just the backup. So I said, no, that's actually your 7501 and your 3461 which is important customs entry documents. So a lot of companies don't know what are the documents that are needed and they don't store it in the required, for the required period. Now for, to be an ISA member, you need to comply with customs rules, which are keeping all the relevant A1A information for a period of five years. Uh, you can keep it electronically once you ask customs for permission, which is still an archaic law, which customs has not yet amended. Uh, but um, having a sound record keeping is very important to join ISA 
and also being able to retrieve information, uh, you know, uh, within a reasonable time period. Suppose custom says, show us this entry, you should be able to retrieve it, even if that information is kept by different departments. And finally, show a spirit of cooperation and partnership with customs. And this could be by joining CTPAT, you know, jo obviously ACE and the ISA program, or even uh, becoming a member of a center of excellence. So friends, uh, let's just do a very quick recap. Um, the application process, Number one, you've got to be a CTPAT member. Number two, you've got to have a system of business records and internal controls to demonstrate accuracy of customs transactions. Then you complete the customs ISA questionnaire, which is really a very simple questionnaire. Uh, it's mostly yes, no, yes, no. Uh, and obviously providing more description uh, helps a lot. Uh, and they also want to see backup documentation. Then Customs is going to review your application, review your history, and then schedule a time for an on-site application review meeting called a ARM, ARM. Then Customs goes back and they do a multidisciplinary board review where the audit team is really making a pitch to uh, the Customs uh, Review Committee saying whether or not you should be accepted as an ISA member. And then, number seven, Customs signs the MOU and the benefits begin. So let's go a little deeper into the actual um, ARM process. Um, sorry, it's said repetitive. So, so we've completed um, one, two, three, four, five already. Then what you need to do is, before you submit your application, create an annual self-testing plan, you know, to mitigate identified risks. This self-testing plan should uh, determine, you know, how many entries you're going to review, who is going to review uh, the initial review, who's going to do the next set of audit. Uh, and Customs wants you to uh, keep results of your testing for a period of three years and make that test information available to customs. Uh, customs also wants you to keep an audit trail, make appropriate disclosures to customs uh, should you ever find any errors. And finally, there's a requirement of an annual notification letter. Uh, the uh, IC application is, um, you know, pretty straightforward uh, with the questionnaire and all uh, applicable attachments. Uh, you also need to include the self-testing plan and the memorandum of understanding. Uh, it's funny that Customs says you can submit it electronically via email or on a compact disc, which goes to show you how the IC program really has not changed uh, in the last um, 13 plus years. The MOU is really straightforward. Uh, it really identifies your responsibilities uh, in joining the ISA and what customs will give you in return. Uh, and you, are, you can also add on other business units if you're a global corporation and include their IOR numbers as well. The ISA questionnaire, as I mentioned, is, uh, is really very straightforward. Uh, the more information you put on it, uh, it will just wow customs. So that's what I uh, tell my customers. Uh, always provide more information to overwhelm them, saying, whoa, we are really impressed. Include names of any procedures you have, uh, reference numbers for any internal guidelines. Uh, all that helps. And then uh, also try to show how you have exceeded the best practices that they've publicized. Now, when Customs looks at your application, they already have a dossier on you. They have your ACE data, what was originally known as your ITRAC data. 
they know which ports you're importing into, how many brokers, what errors, what HTS codes, what preference agreements. They know all of it, right? Uh, so what they also want to do is to see what good internal controls you have. And at this stage, they also want to check, uh, they'll also check your compliance rate, your accuracy compliance rate. And if it's really low, uh, you know, then customs will scrutinize you in greater detail. Then customs is going to uh, let you know that they're coming. Uh, they'll give you many uh, days of adv uh, advance notice. Uh, they usually come in teams of two auditors and your national account manager, if you have one. And usually customs, uh, ahead of time, they'll give you a couple of entry numbers. Could be five, could be four, uh, it may even be more. And they'll say, you know what, we want you to go over and walk us through these different entry numbers from cradle to grave. Now, what does that mean? It means that they want to see all the customs entry documentation, your 7501, 3461, your commercial invoice, packing list. Then they want to see receiving records that you receive those quantities. And they also want to see payment details that you paid your overseas supplier what was listed in the invoice and no more. So that's really the cradle to grave that they want to review. Um, yeah, to do a walkthrough. Now, uh, when I advise my companies on uh, my clients on preparing for an application review meeting, I, I tell them really to over prepare. What I tell them to do is to carve out half an hour uh, for a presentation to the CBP officers. What you should do is in that presentation, try to have some upper management to show management commitment to you, know, have them present. And provide an outline of your global supply chain to customs. Provide an outline of your customs team and um, who your brokers and service providers are and provide a list of all the internal control processes you have so you can really demonstrate all the accuracy and internal controls of your transactions. So that half an hour before customs butts in and says, hey, let's get back to the agenda, is really your chance to show how you're a top-notch company. Uh, continuing on, uh, number four, uh, you know, customs will walk through various entries. Uh, then they'll really spend a lot of time looking at your self-testing plan. The self-testing plan, a customs can get a little uh, nitty-gritty. They want to know which are the areas of high risk you're going to test, how often you're going to test it, who is going to be testing it, and uh, you know what will be the test results in what format? So uh, that can get you. You, you really have to create. Uh, you can't just be loosey goosey. You've got to create a step by step approach uh, and self testing plan for customs to review. Um, give them a tour of your facility. Ask them if they have any questions, obviously. And customs normally is very very cooperative in these meetings. The application review meeting for ISA is totally different from a focused assessment visit by the same auditors, you know, or their colleagues. Um, uh, you know, a customs audit um, or a focused assessment is a little more combative. They're trying to find out the errors you have. But, you know, in the ISA application review meeting, Customs really wants to handhold you across the finish line. They appreciate that you're trying to join this program and they're really trying to do everything possible so that they can convince their agency that you should join ISA. It's a great uh, attitude. After you are finally an ISA member, from the date of application, in the letter given to you by the head of the ISA program, you have 13 months to submit 
your first annual notification letter. That, in a sense, is your major ISA obligation. 13 months from the date of acceptance into the ISA program. From that date onwards, for subsequent years, so suppose you join on the 1st of April, you have till the 1st of May next year to submit your annual notification letter, which is 1st of May 2018. On all subsequent years, you have 12 months from that date, which is May 1st, 2019, May 1st, 2020, to submit your annual notification letter. Now, what is contained in an annual notification letter? Really, what you're doing is you're telling customs, hi, customs, this is our update. We haven't been asleep. We've been doing our monthly reviews. We've been finding errors. We've been reaching out to our brokers to fix those errors. And uh, here's a list of all the changes and updates and errors in our company. Uh, and this is also a annual evaluation report that we did. So um, these are the seven elements that customs wants to see in your ISA annual notification letter. Number one, has there been any organizational changes? Any mergers, any moves, any divestitures, any additions or deletions of your IOR number? Number two, personnel changes. Has the head of trade compliance gone? Has the head of legal, has there been a major change in your trade compliance team? Remember, you had given customs a list of your, um, you know, your, a flow chart of your team. So has there anything changed? Number three, how has your import activity changed? Commodities, countries, trade programs, brokers, freight forwarders. Number four, what are all the changes you've made in your uh, CT band, in, sorry, in your customs compliance procedures? Were some redundant? Have you included new procedures? You know, adding all those details would be helpful. What about your risk assessment results? Periodically, you've been doing your risk assessment, uh, include those results. And also, regularly, you've got to be doing your self-testing plan and include those results as well. What I do is I include results for my, for my customers. Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4, periodic self-testing plan results. And finally, have there been any errors or post-entry adjustments or disclosures you've made to customs? If yes, add those details as well. So that is all the information you need to submit in your annual notification letter. It'll probably take you, uh, you know, maybe a, a day, a month uh, to wrap this up. So it's not that big a deal uh, to, uh, this is not a very onerous challenge. Now, why do some companies not meet the threshold of ISA? Either they're just not ready. They just don't have a good system in place they don't have internal controls, they are not compliant, and they are not able to demonstrate accuracy of their customs transactions to customs. Simple as that. It's a very low bar, but if they can't meet that bar, too bad. Number two, they don't have written procedures. And if you don't have written procedures, you're almost raising a red flag saying, you know, I can't join ISA. Previous unresolved issues, suppose you've had a poor focus assessment or there's an ongoing investigation, uh, then obviously customs is not going to readily grant you ISA status. When I say at risk, I mean, you know, obviously there's uh, some high priority issues uh, that you have, maybe ADD, maybe CVD, uh, anti-dumping, countervailing duties, could be IPR issues. 
obviously an incomplete application. Uh, if you're a non-resin importer, you clearly uh, haven't met the minimum prerequisites. Many times not preparing for your ISA application review meeting can leave a bad sense in customs mouth that you were just unprepared. So um, I tell companies never do that. And also, if one of your group companies is CTPAT, but the other one is applying for ISA, remember every ISA applicant needs to be CTPAT certified. Friends, so that's the background of ISA, the benefits, the prerequisites, what customs wants to see in terms of internal controls, best practices, and the application process as well as the ongoing requirement of the annual notification letter. Now let's talk about the current status of the program from a policy perspective from a 10,000 foot level. And where is it headed? Currently, there's over 600 companies in the ISA program. That's a lot of companies. Uh, as I said before, that's at least a quarter of all US imports by volume. Most of these companies are, uh, you know, they're across industry groups, although electronics would be a big one, uh, followed by the petroleum sector. But, uh, you know, customs is overdue for a rehaul of the ISA program. In fact, the ISA handbook on customs website is several years old, and they haven't put the time and resources in really marketing this amazing program. And I believe it's because Customs, um, uh, you know, put a lot of its emphasis on the whole ACE rollout. And as a result, CTPAD, ISA, focus assessment, a lot of these different programs took a beating or and a backseat. Right now, Customs has announced that its industry advisory group called the COAC, uh, I think it's a commercial operations, sorry, uh, committee, advisory committee, is looking at a transition from ISA to a combined ISA and CTPAC program called the Trusted Trader Program. But they're almost one year late in coming out with this program. So um, personally, I, I think there's, there's nothing on the horizon so if you're sitting on the fence, waiting for changes to happen, I, I would advise you to apply as soon as you can, rather than wait, because I, I don't see any changes happening. But Customs has said that there will be phase two, or enhancements to the ISA program. So we're, we're looking forward to that. Customs hasn't given a date. Recently, they rolled the ISA program under the leadership of the same customs uh, official who manages the CTPAC program. So one imagines there's greater synergies. But um, uh, so we, we just expect uh, in the trade community, uh, we expect uh, the second phase of ISA to be rolled out maybe in the next six months. And uh, there to be greater elements of security and compliance together in the new ISA program, which could be kind of a trusted trader model like many other countries. Friends, uh, with that said, uh, we're up on the hour, and I would be delighted to take any questions. Uh, please uh, go to the chat window and, uh, uh, you know, feel free to ask any questions. All right, a uh, couple of questions coming in, thank you. So uh, what is the average accuracy compliance rate? You know, Customs, um, it hasn't said that there needs to be a minimum uh, accuracy compliance rate in order for you to join ISA. Uh, what I tell my uh, customers is that, um, uh, you know, unless you've got a very high compliance rate, Customs is really gonna scrutinize your uh, application. Um, a high compliance rate 
could be about 95 percent compliance and uh, companies that are less than 90 percent they really have to justify uh, how they have identified and corrected any prior compliance errors or a poor compliance history and you need to do that by showing that now you have a robust documented corrective action and plan for those previous compliance errors so um, a 95 percent compliance rate is perfect but if, even if you don't have that if you've taken corrective action you're in good shape uh, interesting question about an ISA continuation review does it happen you know it does now ISA has been around for the last 12 years since 2002 uh, sorry my math's wrong uh, it's uh, 15 years but um, the last several years customs has been reaching out to, to some old time ISA members who've been in the program the last 10 years and says you know what we'd like to do a continuation review an ISA continuation review which really is just like the application review meeting it's been a long time and they just want to know if you're still doing your auditing and you're still doing your self-testing and self-review and if you still have an up-to-date manual so really they're checking that your internal controls are still in place great question a question on uh, focused assessment so uh, the question is, uh, you know, if you're going through a focus assessment, can you join ISA? The answer is yes. In fact, before you get a notice uh, for focus assessment, you should be looking at ISA already so that you don't get the focus assessment notice. But even if you get your focus assessment notice and custom says we're going to visit you on the 1st of July, you can still apply to ISA and tell the audit team, you know what, we just applied to ISA, so they'll, you know, they'll cancel the focused assessment. That's a great tool. Now, if you were to go through the focus assessment and get a good audit report, customs will invite you to join the ISA going forward. But my suggestion is don't wait for the audit notice. And if you get it, well, certainly uh, try to expedite your ISA application. How long uh, does the ISA application take to be reviewed by customs? Well, you know, um, customs is reviewing their process. Currently, what happens is you're submitting your application to customs. They come and do an application review meeting and they check you out. Then they go back and then they do their, uh, you know, their inter-committee review, uh, which, you know, uh, takes place once a month and if you're you know uh, so basically it could be four to six months before you're accepted and that is too long so customs is looking at some revisions to this program where uh, instead of um, the interagency review after you submit your application to customs and they do the applic their on-site application review meeting you know, they immediately decide whether or not you're ready to be a CT, uh, an ISA member. So they'll bypass an internal step on their end. So if that were the case, it would really speed up the process and make it like three months instead of four to six months. But right now it takes that long. Which industries uh, are typically members? Uh, like I said, um, uh, it's across the board. Uh, companies, usually it's companies that are, have significant imports, uh, medium to large companies. There are a lot of tech companies for some reason that have joined, but that's not uh, any uh, trend. Um, there's also companies of all different uh, walks of life, including consumer goods, uh, chemicals, plastics, um, also a lot of pharmaceutical companies. Uh, another question on valuation issues. <laughs> Uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, what exactly did you mean that your company has valuation issues? Just a second. Okay. 
So if your company has related party valuation issues, which you cannot disclose to customers, that is not a bar to joining ISA. Uh, I've had a very interesting example with uh, one of the largest companies in the world that was uh, a US company, but its headquarters was in Asia and they did not want to divulge details of their related party pricing beyond providing the IRS um, uh, you know, advanced pricing uh, uh, arrangement, the APA. So uh, there was a lot of back and forth. Customs said, no, we want to know how, what the cost of your goods is. And this company said, sorry, we will not give you the cost of our goods. This is our related party pricing that your treasury department has accepted, uh, the IRS. And finally, Customs kind of capitulated. They just turned over and they said, okay, that's fine. Uh, welcome to ISA. So if you can justify uh, that you have some reasons for keeping some information confidential, you know, customs isn't uh, unreasonable. But it depends upon how critical that information is and uh, how uh, uh, disadvantaged you'd be if the information gone out. Um, any other uh, questions? Best practices for self-testing plan. So, you know, you really need to get your self-testing plan uh, correct, uh, which is by um, having it well documented. Uh, you need to identify to customs which are your major risk areas and then come up with a testing plan uh, with uh, a regular frequency of what you're going to ch ch uh, check, how often you're going to check it, who is going to be auditing it, uh, checking it, and if there's any next level review. So having a very tight self-testing plan uh, is something the customs wants to see. Friends, um, you, uh, absolutely. Can we get a copy of the presentation? Uh, absolutely. I'll send it right away. Uh, friends, and I just want to um, extend an invitation to um, all of you. If you'll have any questions that for any reason you're uh, shy or can't think of uh, during this call, uh, feel free to send me an email. Uh, my uh, email address is right here. Oh, oops, sorry. Uh, deep at dsgglobal.com. And I'm delighted to schedule some time over the phone to answer your questions. Uh, any other questions at this time? Oh, okay. Sorry. Sorry, my mouse has a mind of its own today. I apologize. Okay. Sorry about that. Friends, um, <laughs> with no further questions, uh, I will uh, uh, give you back uh, the next uh, 20 minutes. But um, uh, thanks again for uh, attending DSG Global Academies, joining the Importer Self-Assessment Program. Uh, have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.